Okay, hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, it's been quite some time since we saw you, but we're back now. Um, the reason that Zach and I were away for the month of July was there was this program called the Wolfram Summer Camp, where Zach and I were both mentors. So we were helping high school students who were attending the camp to create some really neat projects. Um, there was a lot of cool computational essays that came out of that program. In fact, I think if you want to scroll through them, see what they are, we'll probably be putting that link in the chat. Uh, so definitely feel free to look at what we've been up to in the last month. Uh, that was the first half of July. In the second half, I was attending a camp also at Wolfram called the Wolfram Data Science Boot Camp. That was a camp where I learned a lot about data science. Um, we talked about the multi-paradigm aspect that Wolfram technology allows, which is that we can sort of do anything with data. Um, we're not constrained by what we're allowed to do to get to our answer. All we need is what's our question, what do we want to know, and we can figure it out using a multitude of, of methods, including machine learning uh, and other things. So. We're going to be looking, we're, we're taking a bit of a break from Rosetta Code. We thought that was a great program and we had a lot of fun with it. And we've in fact kind of beat that horse a lot. Um, so we figured we'll try something new and we're going to be doing something related to data science. So hopefully I'll be able to share sort of what I've learned at that camp. Uh, and hopefully everyone can kind of learn something about data science today. Uh, this is sort of new. We'll just be taking some data and seeing what we can get live. So just bear with us. It, it'll go great. Um, Zach, did you want to say anything? Uh, no, I think you covered it. We had a great time at the summer camp. Um, really excited to get back into it. We're hopping into some stuff. We're going to explore some stuff from the data repository. So hopefully we can you know, learn something really cool. And if you have any ideas what we can do with it, or you want to see us try something with it, just let us know. Yeah, if you at any time have any suggestions, definitely throw them in the chat and we'll we'll try to see what we can do. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen here. And what we're going to start out with is looking at the Wolfram data repository. So this is sort of an open source location for a bunch of data. This is all out in the cloud and in the Wolfram cloud, that is. And it's a repository where anyone can upload data, but a lot of it is curated by Wolfram or provided by Wolfram. Um, it needs to be sort of approved to be up there. So we know that it's mostly good data. It's, it's not just that anyone can throw garbage out, out there. It's anyone can throw things and then it needs to be curated and approved. So something that I learned a lot about, something that I think is really neat is this thing called entity store. It's a type of data. It's a way to access data, sort of. And it's relatively new. There's only 19 resources on here that are in entity store format, but it's pretty powerful. So I wanted to just give it a look and see you know, what this sort of new format allows us to do. Uh, the data that I thought might be nice is there's this data here on FDIC institutions, uh, as I understand. So FDIC is the federal agency that ensures sort of banking and financing institutions. So all of that needs to be public data, of course. So here's the data curated in a way that we can access it in the Wolfram language. So the nice thing about it is, okay, we've got this resource object. It shows what we would get. And I can actually just copy that piece of code into a Wolfram notebook, start pulling that data from the cloud. And after it takes a little bit to find it, there we have it, there's that resource object. That's neat. That'll give us some, some descriptions about the data, where the data is located, uh, its size, what its type is. So for us to actually start using the data, we're gonna have to register this entity store. And there, that's easy as pie. So, Entities are, entities have been around for a, a decent amount of time. They are a really nice way to access data in the Wolfram language. So in general, 
we can get entities from the free form info input, which is control equals. So I just opened up a little box there from control equals. And we can type things in here like United States. And this will give me the entity representing the United States. And I can get information about it by asking, oh, what's its population? That'll query the, the data and there we get it. It's a unit, it's people, and it's some number, 330 million. Awesome. So this is the way that a lot of data in the Wolfram language can be accessed. And now we have FDIC data in the same format as this country data, or as there's, there's plenty of entities. There's genetic data and food data. Yeah. Um, Hundreds, yeah. <laughs> There's loads of stuff. And the great thing is that all of this data, it's customizable. So depending on what entity you're calling or what kind of object you're calling, you'll get different data points, you'll get different sets of data. And the other nice thing is any of your data you pull out, whether it's a number or text, is going to come out in a format that you can easily work with in the Wolfram language. So you're not going to have to, all these are already formatted to be, you know, uh, acted on and used. Right. Yeah, and like you said, it's all you you use them all in the same way. So once you've learned how to use one set of data, you kind of know how to use them all. And that's really handy in terms of okay, now I can, you know, I've I've worked with say city data. Now I can work with this FDIC data that I just pulled from the cloud and I kind of know the structure already. So this here is just a list of all the built-in entity classes. There's a a lot of them. I think something like over oh, 300 or so. There's so many. It's a lot of these ones are curated by um, uh, Wolfram Alpha. Yeah. Because um, Wolfram Alpha uses uh, a lot of these entity stores for its searches. Yes. And its exactly. computational searches. Yeah. So Wolfram <laughs> Alpha, I'm sure most of you know, is sort of our computational, the best way to access this sort of computation. So if I wanted to say, what's the tallest building in the world? it'll actually compute that instead of going and, and searching for it. So mm -hmm. there you have it, the Burj Khalifa. And, and in fact, Wolfram Alpha is always being updated. We just yep. added this new math input here. So what I just used was a natural language, but I could do some sort of math input. Um, if you hit the three dots, you'll get, oh, there you go. You get all yeah. So I've got all these different math symbols that I can insert and I can actually just type in math, sort of in a almost LaTeX type of format, and then have it calculate. So, oh, we'll do some integral. Uh, and there you have it. Sine is an odd function, so it's integral across periodic boundaries at zero. Look at that. Great. There you so go. there's your math input. <laughs> and the nice thing is if you do a Wolfram Alpha input or Wolfram Alpha call with the Wolfram language, say you just want to look for something, mm -hmm. uh, you can do that and it will most cases return an entity back if you're searching for an object. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. So I use it to find, um, to find if we have like certain uh, geographic entities because there's so right. many different ones. So yeah, like we've got some mountain data i don't know mountain Olympus. that's a real mountain right <laughs> not just from oh apparently yeah i mean probably geography is <laughs> not my strong suit so i'm sorry so we can do different sorts of things with it this might not actually work oh there it is mount olympus is somewhere in there i didn't actually put a, a marker it's, on it it's but... probably at the center yeah <laughs> usually have these they usually put them in the middle right um, yeah but yeah, so you can you can do that, and you can use that to search a little more intelligently instead of trying to just kind of guess. Oh, is there maybe an entity around? Right. Yeah, it'll sort of figure it out for you. All right, so let's check out first just the structure of this entity store. Um, so the first thing I'm going to try is seeing. Ooh, this needs to be a little string there. This is the name of the entity itself, sort of the class, just like gene is the name of the genetic entity class. Mm -hmm. So let's see how many entities there are. 5,679 FDIC insured companies in this data set. Neat. Uh, and we could do the same thing. We could find the 
property count. So each of those entities has a property and they each have 54. So there's 54 times 5,000 different possible properties that we could be gaining. So there's a, there's a lot of data. A lot. In there. Yeah. And yeah. any entity can have any number of properties. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, every entity class has a different number of properties. Right. Like if I have. looked at the countries, how many properties there are, there's 751 because that, that's a big data set. There's a lot of information we've curated about countries. Yeah, there's a lot of geographic polygon stuff. There's actually a <laughs> whole entity set for historical countries too. So you can look uh, at right. old countries borders. Right, yeah, that's really neat. Uh, okay, so we've got the 54 properties and well, what are they? What information can we learn about these entities? Uh, and what we could do is use the, so I, I always use entity properties and that'll just give you a list of the properties of some entity. Okay, then we have it in a list. Let's make that a data set just so we can see it a little bit nicer. Ah, cool. Um, and it looks like it's done some sort of weird formatting there. So I don't see them as actual entities. And I'm pretty sure I've, I've used this and there's a way to get them to look correct. Is ah, this, this item display oh. function? Yeah. Okay. So this is just an option here. And if I say no item display function, boom. And then we can see them as actual, actual entity properties. So these are entity properties. They've got some short names, but when you hover over them, you see the more longer name. Uh, and this is all the data that we could get about one of these entities. Um, I'll kind of leave that as is for now because it doesn't make much sense to know the data you can get about something without knowing what that something is. And the way that I would usually start this is by just getting a random entity from this class. So this will just pull, remember we saw there were over 5,000 different entities in the FDIC database. So this is just one of those, the first National Bank of Gillette. We can see Mass Mutual Trust Company. So it's a lot of different banks and financial institutions, mostly banks, because they're the ones that are getting FDIC insured. Cool, a lot of different banks, okay. So let's start with one of these and we can view all of its properties in a data set format by asking for the data set. So this is how I like to visualize it. Up here, you saw me use a data set. I think it's a great way to be able to scroll through and just see what's going on in your data. So on the left here, we've got the property for First Texas Bank and on the right is its value. So its bank equity is $53 million, common stock 1 million, cool. This will tell us also, like we saw up here, so all of the things in this first column, those are these properties that we pulled earlier. So we didn't even quite need to do that because uh, we got them all right here. And we can see kind of the format of what its output would be. So this $1 million here, if I copy that data to my clipboard, I see that it's actually a quantity. It's actually the quantity 1 million. It's not just a string with a dollar sign. If I were to look at its input form, it's actually the quantity 1 million in US dollars, which means that we can do computations on that, like convert it to other currencies or any sort of thing. So that's really handy. So, what we want to figure out is what we can do with this. Um, I always like to do geographic data stuff. So I see here we got a position, state, street address. So we can do a lot of geographic things right off the bat. Um, if this position is robust, it looks like here it's giving us the coordinates. That would be pretty nice. Let's see. If I say, what's the position of First Texas Bank? It's actually a geoposition object. That's great because we can do oh, geographics of that. I should do that, of that. And it's somewhere in there. Let's see. Um, I'd probably need to, I need to do like a geo marker. 
let's see. Oops. I hope if I spell geo marker right. And if I go to the ah, okay, cool. So I can just do geo marker that, and it'll drop a pin right on the bank. There's your bank. Wow. Pretty cool. Very cool. Can we um <clears throat> let's um let's try to get like let's locate the ten uh, largest surplus banks. Okay, so s this surplus value there. Yes, I don't know what that means, but it's a number. Um, okay. Right. Yeah, I don't know what it means <laughs> per yeah, se, but but we're just of kind of properties. exploring here, right? And then if someone who knows more about this stuff wants to see what they can do with it now that they know how to how to explore it, definitely feel free. So if I wanted the top 10, I would go to a filtered entity class. Um, there are other ways to do this, but this way will give it the top 10 in order, which is what I want. Um, and maybe I'll talk about some other ways that we could do this too. So we'll do it in, uh, let's see, if we wanted the top 10, would we want it in descending order? So largest first. And I think, uh, no, let's see if we go to, or sorry, did I say filter? I think I meant sorted entity class. Yes. So there's a ton of different functions here um, that I learned about at this camp. And luckily there were some really good lectures on them because otherwise I look at all these like entity class, aggregated entity class, combined, complemented, there, extended. There's just a ton. A lot of these are new in uh, what's it called? Yeah. Um, the 12. And in I 12, think they're, yeah. uh, they're, um, they're to give, you know, the same data set and list functionality that we have with, you know, data. So we're using select and sort by and group by to hopefully bring it to entity classes. Yeah. Right. So in general, when you're using these entity classes, they'll be in a sort of um, symbolic representation. So it, it kind of returned what I'd typed out here. It didn't actually do anything. Um, it, it appears at least, but that's so that we can actually do computations on this later and it will then go in and find what those are. So if I wanted to list this, it should work. Ah, so cool. this so this holds it. So it does what a uh, hold does, right? Sort of, yeah. When I do this, it doesn't actually really do any, it doesn't contact the database at all. Mm, it just okay. creates this object sort of. Okay. And then what this object does is it lets me do uh, things on it like entity list, or I could do entity value on the whole class and find values of properties. So by holding it symbolically until I actually want to get the data from it, it sort of saves needing to call the database a bunch of times. And it lets me do more things with this class than if I were to get the data right off the bat. So right there, we've got it. We've got the top 10 uh, surplus in, in, and this is ordered. So Bank of America is number one, has the largest surplus. That's cool. Um, and since I mentioned it, I believe there is another way that I could have done pretty much the same thing, uh, but it will be slightly different and hopefully I'll be able to show why. So I could do surplus and I could say take largest 10. And if I were to list this, so this isn't doing a sorted entity class, this is just an entity class. And we see that it's actually in a different order but we still have the same ones, Bank of America, Bank of America, City Bank, City Bank. So it's the same list of 10 items, just these aren't actually sorted by surplus. They're sorted probably by something else. There's really no way to know for sure. And that's why I prefer to do this sorted entity class so that I know what order they're gonna be in. So there's that little difference. Um, if we wanted to get the positions of all these, then I could do an entity value. So now this is just that symbolic entity class, and I'm going to get a value for every entity in that class. That's why it's really neat to have it remain symbolic until I actually want to query it. So I could ask for the position for all of them. 
and we get some geo positions. If I wanted to, I could do in, uh, I think I need to do entity association. And this, ah, cool. So this actually structures it in a much nicer way. We've got an association of the bank pointing to its location. And we see that we don't have that data for Chase Bank, which is kind of surprising. But this is one of the big deals about doing sort of data science is dealing with data that's missing. Uh, and I think it's pretty nice in the Wolfram language that we have this missing function. So instead of this being like zero or giving us a failure or something like that, it can actually be this sort of symbolic missing piece of data. And what I could do is say I said this is a sort of plus, I'll just assign it to a value. And I wanted to find, say I wanted to find the missing pieces of that. So it actually returns this, the piece that's missing. Um, cool. And I could even then delete that. So we got rid of the missing one. Chase Bank is now gone. Uh, and so what this is doing is it's looking for that head missing right here. And so anything that's wrapped in missing gets deleted by delete cases. It's pretty neat, pretty nice way to handle it, I think. Um, but also in general, a lot of missing data will be handled sort of automatically if you don't do anything with it. It'll just kind of get pushed to the side by the program. And so you might not even have to worry about it, really. It'll, it'll just kind of ignore it. And we might see that coming up in a bit, depending on what we do with this. Uh, so what I want to do, I think, is get the positions of all of these, every single bank. Um, and that's pretty easy as well. We can just do an entity value of, ugh, I'm going to misspell institution so many times today. So I can just get the position and there we have it, a list of geo positions. Pretty neat. If I wanted to get that association like we saw before. Uh, that's taking some more time, but there we got it. We've got the bank pointing to its position. Great. Um, but what can we do with these? I'm actually going to work with the smaller amount of data. Uh, so let's say that these are the positions. So we've got just kind of a list of positions here, right? So what if we did a geolist plot? That's what comes to mind, my mind first. Um, and what geolist plot is going to do is it's taking a list of positions and generating a map of them. So for regions, it's going to highlight them. For, let's see. Um, oh, these ones. Yeah, so for actual little positions, it'll just kind of give you a dot. Let's see. Ah, OK. Oh, so we see that we've got banks literally all over the country, all the way up in Alaska, Hawaii. Cool. So um, two things. I see that the dots are really big. So it's just kind of a red blob. And maybe I don't want to look at the ones that are way far out. So this, let's see, geo list plot is going to take the same options as geo graphics, which I know geo range is the big one. Um, and I can just say geo range is only the United States. Let's see if this works. Ooh, time to have Try typing in United States. Yeah. You were able to pull it up earlier, so. I was, yeah, I, I did this exact same thing earlier. So I think my, my network might've just been uh, not happy. Because there is some network action going on behind that query. Um, it's working on it, it's thinking about it. Let's see. Still, oh, yeah, I'll try United States, like you said. You might get something a little better. 
Hopefully it's a little happier with that. Hopefully it's not a network issue. <laughs> wow, yeah. okay. It seems like okay. it might be a network issue. Yeah, I think I'm having some network issues. Uh, let's see if I can... Hmm. Huh. Well, that's okay. Um, what I can do is go find the country data here and actually just recreate that uh, recreate that country. So here it is right from the documentation. I can just paste it there. But if I wanted to type and, it out. And this is worth, um, this is kind of the other thing. If we use an entity as a property in a function, it will usually in most cases uh, intelligently or at least try to intelligently find the property that best fits what you're like using it for. Mm. So if you give it like, you know, if you give it like geo range or you want a geo polygon and you give it United States, it'll make the geo polygon of the United States. Yeah, that's a good point. So maybe it'll work out. Oh, yeah. OK, so it actually worked outside. So it was a little confused by having it inside there. She may just didn't like the call. Oh, we can always store that stuff, too. So you can you can store entities, you know, as a variable. So. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But also, if you ever needed to type it out, it's actually somewhat simple to type in. It's just entity type country, and it's the United States. So you could also do it kind of manually that way. But mm -hmm. personally, I can't really ever remember exactly what that is. Sometimes, uh, since it doesn't always, um, what's it called, execute, mm -hmm. um, it's, you won't ever know for sure if you're using an entity that is recognized exactly. as an entity or not or you're just using like an entity head right like if i were to i don't know get rid of the a in there it still looks like the same but yeah. if i put the a back in it actually gives me that nice looking united yeah. states yeah yeah so that's a good point you, it's kind of it can be hard to tell whether you've made a mistake until it becomes obvious okay so here we have every bank with a dot on it I kind of cheated a little and just made the dots little periods. Um, that's a way to get a, a small point. So maybe not the best way, but it's pretty short. Like shorthand nice. way to do it. Yeah. So nice we block. see there's not a lot of banks out west. It's a lot clustered in by New York. Makes this is the bank in, in any of the national parks. <laughs> kind of letting us down. I don't know how I'm going to get anything out there. Right. <laughs> um. And something that this brings to mind with, as I was seeing, like, there's not a lot here, but there is a lot there. We can use a function that I learned about called GeoSmooth histogram. Is this going to, like, and while I get that separate? Running, so this is sort of, it's it's exactly, oh, oh, that was quick. Oh, so it's a heat plot. I like that. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. So this is just like having a regular wow. histogram if I wanted to make a histogram of the numbers one, 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 four, four, and five. So we've got a lot of ones, a couple fours, and one five. So there's a lot of data here in this bin and not a lot of data there in that bin. So it kind of bins data together uh, and shows you the relative magnitude of how much data is in that small region. It's a 2D. This is like a 2D. Yeah. Plot. So this, so this does it. Program. I like that. Like you said, across the whole two-dimensional map. And it's not super informative without a legend. So let's give it some legends. Automatic. Hopefully, if we say automatic. Yeah, cool. it's got it. Cool, so cool, this cool. Is, and this is a density plot. So this is in uh, this is yeah. uh, data density. Can we can we switch that to a uh, I guess to raw data? Uh, or I mean, I don't I don't know if you can do this off the top of your head. So it's okay if it's not possible. I think the geo smooth might mean that it's uh, what's it called data density, but also we should someone recommended trying geo vector. I think that would be kind of fun to try. Ooh, geo vector, yeah. Let's look at that. So geo vector here gives us. Um, I think we would need a direction with that to Gosh. to sort of orient that arrow. Um, so um, well, hmm. I'm. Sure what we can do? 
you, we could tie could we tie the direction of the g of the vector to how much money it has or how much uh <laughs> maybe maybe as a thought i don't, I don't know if that's going to be easily done but it, it might be fun to see something along that thought that i was thinking we could do is we could take so right now this is just the locations of banks and we see that we have most banks actually out here in kind of illinois which is a little surprising to me but i don't know that much about banks so <laughs> um you do a lot of banking out there right but i think it, maybe it might make more sense if we weighted each bank by say its net assets right so that if a bank has a lot of money then it's more important for this map and if it has a little amount of money, then it's kind of less important. Uh, and so the way that I would do that is this nice thing that I also learned about within the last couple of weeks called weighted data. So we can weight data by some amount of weights. Um, and what we can do is we can actually weight positions by net assets or total assets, something, some sort of assets, the amount of money they have. <laughs> so then it'll kind of be showing us a smooth histogram of the money in a bank distribution as opposed to just the bank distribution. So what we would need to do is you know, type out institution again, wish me luck. No, that's not right, institution, that looks right. Um, we're going to need the position and we're going to need, I think, so when I look at this data, there's actually only one example of using it here, um, which is kind of why we picked it. There's not a lot of examples of using it. So we figured kind of why not flesh it out, add some yeah. more spice to it. Um, Michael Gilson says that we're planning a heist and we are looking <laughs> for the banks with the most amount of money stored. Uh, the most surplus True. available so you know or at least the pay yeah. no attention to this pay no attention to it i guess you could use this to determine where a bank heist might be more likely yeah because where we want to go this is kind of telling you where you're more likely to like stumble into a bank right <laughs> but so out, Flip out west coin. you're less likely to just you know find a bank if you're walking around but if we weight it by the amount of money in the bank then I don't we're I talking more about possible. <laughs> I, uh, okay we're gonna get some interesting recommendation with that i don't know if that's possible and i don't know if i really want to explore the ramifications if it is possible yeah i don't we'll know keep about... going though we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep trying to make our uh, our stuff yeah so the one uh example that's provided here in the sort of documentation for the data is plotting number of employees versus number of assets you see that there's a relatively linear relationship i think that's actually pretty neat to see or sorry actually these are oh never mind they're logarithmic they're logarithmic so it's not linear okay cool anyway uh, i didn't notice that but what's important to me is that the total assets is what we're looking for here that's kind of the amount of money in the bank as far as i understand it someone could probably correct me on that but um so what i'm saying is before we just had entity value of the institution and the position, now we want its position and its assets. Uh, so we'll call this, I don't know, assets. And what we get is a bunch of lists of geo positions. So that's a location and the amount of money. Cool. Um, let's see. So to get it in the format for weighted data, we need a list of data and a list of weights. So the data is the geo positions and the weights is the money. And currently it's sort of in the opposite format. It's a list of position comma money. So if we just transpose this data, so we're sort of taking this whole matrix and transposing it, kind of flipping the rows and columns sort of. And now we're, we've got one list of all the queue positions and one list of hopefully all the money. Cool. Perfect. Um, okay, great. So if I 
took this transposed assets, I could turn it into weighted data by, yeah, it looks like we need to pass the two separately. So I'm doing apply here. Um, what that's saying is it's replacing this external list with weighted data. So instead of us having a list and a list inside of a list, we have a list and a list inside of weighted data. There we have it. It's this big piece of, of weighted data. Um, let's, let's try it, let's see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll know right away. Okay, <clears throat> great. So I just need to, I'm gonna add a legend again and move my geo range to be just the continental United States. And this should give us a bit of a different picture. Yeah, okay, pretty neat, wow. So we saw up here, this is just where the banks are. So the banks are kind of localized, for they're, they're spread out across the entire east half of the United States, but pretty dense up here in Illinois, which is interesting. Um, but now we've got different hotspots of big banks. And I wonder if this might just be totally dominated by those bigger banks that we had listed earlier, like Bank of America, Citibank, Wells Fargo. That's what I would imagine is that it's kind of being dominated by that, but it, it might not be. Um, well, we can certainly find out. Yeah. So one thing I want to do is I kind of want to mess with the actual background that this geo map's giving us. Um, that's nice and all, but I know that we have a lot of different backgrounds we could use, so why not look at some of those? So, you know, the default is an unlabeled map. Ah, cool. We can, if we do geo background street map, it says it'll add some labels in there. I should probably do some things to make this quicker, <laughs> like if I, so I'll do that calculation there so that I don't have to keep doing it. Um, but, okay, cool. So now we've got some state labels, so I don't have to remember my geography. That's nice. But yeah, we see the same hotspots. Um, Try some other things like satellite, but I think that's fine. Okay, so yeah, we wanted to test the hypothesis <laughs> that these big banks are located in those hotspots. So it's actually pretty helpful that we saw earlier how to create this list of biggest banks. Um, let's do the same thing, but with the largest by total asset. Oh, cool. Wow. It's actually a somewhat different list, and I don't even know what State Street Bank and Trust Company is, if I'm being honest, but it's it's bank. Um, and what we could do is we could put these, put these in a geo list plot of, oh, hold on. Let me just, before I start throwing a bunch of stuff here, why don't I say big banks is this list. There's our list of big banks. And if I wanted to, I might need to get the position of each one. Yeah, let's see. So if I get the position of the big bank, then we got the plot, but I also got, oh, okay. So there's some missing data in there. That makes sense. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So we see that the positions are, we got one that's missing. So why don't we just delete that? So delete cases, we kind of saw this earlier, but let's delete the missing ones. Nice, and it's gone. So now we only have nine geo positions. We'll call that locations. 
And if we create a geo list plot of those, cool. So I want to do geo markers. We can map that across that list, and we've got some markers. Okay, cool. Um, so probably what we want to do is put these together on top of that. Mm, yes. So if I say this is histogram, I should be able to just use show and say this is markers. I should be able to show the histogram with the markers on top of it. And there we have it. Wow. Okay, very neat. So we see that actually, yeah, in the dead middle of that probably largest spot there, we've got one bank and that one is, ooh, we have to create some labels here. Ah, this is getting a little tough now. How do we actually kind of, so we've gone from how do we get the data to sort of how do we really create sort of something that's pretty cohesive with the data. And let's try, hmm. What if we got these into an association? This should still probably work the same. No, okay. Um, what did I do there? Wow, I don't even wanna look at that. <laughs> we'll ignore that for now. Boy, oh boy. Um, but I'm gonna look at GeoMarker. I imagine that this would have some sort of name that we can give it. Let's see. Oh, maybe not. Uh, maybe I'm looking for something else. Do you know if there's like a geo label or something that I'm looking for, Zach? Oh, I'm trying <laughs> to think right now. Uh, you probably, geo marker is probably what you want, but man. Oh, here you go. You can geo label them. Just geo labels true and see what it puts on there. It'll probably, it's probably going to print out the entire name of it, but it's fine. If I do this, does that work? No. What are the, yeah, I would do geo label. Geo, geo labels, true. Let's see what it gives us. Oh. I'm still going to. What is it doing? Big, big error. Um, okay. It's not. Um, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, you just map a coordinate transition and just be like print text using uh, epilogue. I can Hello. do it without the labels if I just take what we had before, which was just the geo positions. So that's just the values of this association. Mm -hmm. um, but then I lose sort of that ability to label them, which I was hoping I would retain. Let's see. Maybe if I go. I'm going to go into GeoList plot, which is what I'm using. See if there's an option to add markers. Plot markers. Is that what I'm looking for? Uh, sort of. <laughs> I guess. But that's not labeled. Let's see. Uh, these geo labels are nice. What if, what if I do this? This won't work, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, but it's kind of close actually. I don't know why we're getting map name short and missing. Um, I look more into what geo labels is actually doing and what its possible options are. Ooh, apply function to each of the names. Um, what if that function is just itself? Nothing. What if, what other ways could we label this? It's kind of strange. I don't know how it's actually getting these names of these cities. Uh, 
Um, okay, so in this C also, it's reminded me of something like a tooltip where you can hover over data and get what it is. Um, maybe we'll try that. Yeah, maybe we'll try that. So tooltip displays label as a tooltip while the mouse pointer is in the area where expression is displayed. So if I, I've got this big association here. I want a tool tip, you know, tool tip of the geo position and then it's uh, value there, or sorry, it's key. So I think what I want is associate, <laughs> association, today is a spelling contest, association map. Very ah, nice. cool. So now we have an association. Yeah, so I can create a tooltip of the, let's see, I want, um, <laughs> so this is using f of key value. So we've got f is this function that I'm creating right now. We want it to be key, which should be the second one or sorry yeah okay i'm pretty sure this is where this is gonna work but does this make sense to you zach do you see what i'm trying to do um i think it's i think what you're on the right track i think that you're using a tooltip is gonna work but i'm just not sure if it's going to oh boy i don't know if i liked it um i'm not sure if it's going to no it seems like it's right um, I think you need to oh, assign yeah. that to a variable and then you just need to put it in. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. So this is, we'll say it's labeled. Coming up with some bad variable names today, but... That's fine. Oh, so close. That's a geoplot label film. Uh, Possible that geolistplot you... doesn't accept tooltips. I think you need to, I think there's a function for like, I think there is like a very tooltips. Right there. So you can attach. So if E, I think, refers to an arbitrary, so E refers to like a list of elements, I think. Oh, E, you think E is? So E is like each point. So if you put tooltip labeled, if you put like your labels for your tooltips, and then that E defines like where it's positioned. Mm. I used it. Let me let me just I'll pull up my example of it when I used it. Uh, 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 I used it to plot. Uh, I used it to display the position of a home run. Hit. I think I got something that works. Okay. I kind of cheated. I realized that what it was mad about is that I have this as an association um, instead of a list. So I cheated a little and just changed it into a list. <laughs> so I replaced association with list here using apply. And then we've got a list instead of an association. Um, so I think it's a little bit happier with that. Yeah, I think that's kind of what we wanted. Um, and now we've got these little red dots and we can see, ah, there's Citibank. And there, is there another one? Yeah, Wells Fargo and Citibank are right there. Cool, so I didn't even realize that. Let's see how big I can make this. Pretty big is the answer. And we got, yeah, Citibank and Wells Fargo right there. So that's probably why this is a pretty big hotspot. Then in Ohio, we've got JP Morgan. Some other banks. That's pretty cool. That's Lots a nice. Banks. That's a nice plot. Yeah, that was fun. So, um, I believe it, you can change the background of your geo plot with like, what is that? It's like uh, geo theme or geo background, and you can choose like marketing or vector marketing. Mm. These are like kind of interesting ones. I think these are really nice because they they invert the color of the map. Oh. And I think, does vector mean that it doesn't do? Uh, so actually, if you, if you, if you enlarge it, it should like start to display stuff. 
like as you enlarge it. Obviously, this is a big scale of a map, so it's not gonna enlarge it. But if you were mm -hmm. at like the street level, it would display like streets and stuff. Oh, so if I actually zoomed in deeper, cool. Yes, yeah, you would get stuff like that. It's yeah. just like an inverse. It's just an interesting yeah. thing. Vector is not one. It's okay. There's lots of different geo themes though. So. Yeah. Do you have other ones you wanted to look at? Oh, I don't know. I think... Off the top of my head, you use satellite, but yeah, you know, we kind of lose a lot of useful like information if we're like. Right. We're only showing like. Yo, so oh, cool. <clears throat> well, it seems like banks with a lot of money tend to shy away from mountains. So <laughs> mountains are bad for business. So. Yeah, Just, there you have it. As I've read, as, we as one can, um, it is totally causation. We can tell right here. Look at the data. Um, yeah, uh, I think so, yeah. what's pretty interesting to me with this is so we have, we've got that, and if I just take this that we'd created earlier or no not do you want to do you want to like maybe look at something different like look at a different thing i was thinking about looking at uh, if you go back up to the property list there's total unearned like income from like loans oh i would so, be interested to look at that it's is all it the this way number of oh i'll look at the one yeah it's it's really down there it's like total uncollected income earned on loans i don't know what that means it just sounds very interesting or we could look at total loans. Oh, or, so maybe we could see where their income comes from? I mean, I guess. Yes. I don't. <laughs> it's very fun to look at this data, but it's very hard for me sometimes to understand what we're getting from it. I fear we can look at something else if you want. We could look at zip code divided by number of employees. That'll tell us nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Look, okay, we're, we're, we have a recommendation. Look at tier two risk based capital. I want to say that I saw, yeah. Twice, as, of... twice as interesting as tier one. Oh. All right. Yeah, I guess they don't sell furniture. So, um, how am I going to get a specific one? That's actually a pretty good question. How do I get to, do? to tier two risk based? Well, don't you just grab that entity, like that property? It's a property. Oh, it's a property? Yeah, it's a property. Oh, I thought it was a bank. No, 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 no. It's a property. I don't uh, think a, a bank called Tier 2 Risk Capital is really <laughs> popular, people. Well, Tier 1 is apparently popular. No, we're, we're learning something. Uh, tier 2 is designated the second supplementary layer of a bank's capital. It's composed of items such as reevaluation reserves, hybrid instruments, and subordinated term debt. It's considered less secure than Tier 1. Oh. Um, it's more difficult to liquidate. However, in the United States, overall capital. All right. Well, I appreciate the Wikipedia article on it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't get a lot of it, but it seems like to be risky. It's a risky investment. So we can measure oh, okay. how much risky investment they're making. And we will not talk any further about it. <laughs> can see... And how much of their deposits are insured? Hmm, that could be good. I would like that better than risky investments. I don't want to really want to lose faith in my banking institutions by looking at the amount of risk yeah. uh, assumed. Okay, so would would we learn something by tier two divided by tier one? Would that be like a percent of how risky it is? I if guess that would be a good tier... ratio. That'd be a good ratio. Well, tier one yeah. capital is less risky. It's still an investment, but it would be interesting to look at the ratio, I guess, as opposed to high risk to low risk. Yeah. I think that would be a, an interesting, like... Uh... Okay, so this is... Oops. Uh, I want to just grab that property. Oh, why don't I look in here? That's a better way to do it. So we've got... Uh, there it is, tier two. I copy that. Okay, and we've got tier one right above it. We're going to copy that. And let's do like tier one divided by tier two. So this is just kind of pseudocode for what we want to find. Um, but a way that we can make this actual code is by creating an entity function. 
this is a pretty neat, powerful way to learn more from your entities. You can create a function that will compute a new property based off of your data. So here they're finding the atomic mass divided by the atomic number for the noble gases. Pretty neat. So we can find the tier one capital Oops. divided by the tier two capital. Or did we want to do it the other way around? Oh, this we want fine. we want ratio of tier two to tier one. Okay. So I'll do move tier two up to the top. Just do a little cut and paste. Never hurts. Oops. Bottom. There we go. And let's see. So we could apply that to maybe we'll get like a random entity first. Yeah, uh, we'll take a look. Just give me one of those. So Mountain Pacific Bank. Um, applying this function to it, we see that it's got, uh, you know, a number. <laughs> We see that first off, it's held in an infinite precision sort of form. Um, see the precision, it's infinity. So if we wanted to get it in more of a human legible format, we can just break it down to a, a, a numerical number and we get about 13%. Or we could probably do, I think we could turn this even into like percent form. Cool, 13%. Nice. Um, wow, that's pretty neat. There you have it. Uh, I could even bring this percent form inside of the entity function. All the risk is in Illinois. Interesting. Can we look at the, can we look at like, you know, maybe the top 10 best? Yeah. So. Or worst. So we want to find... Uh, we want to find the okay, ones where that. this value is. I'm not sure we can do that. Um, yeah, go ahead. Highest. We want to find it where it's highest. Yes. And lose confidence. I don't know if this will work actually. Oh. Huh. I think it did. All right. And well, there you have it. Bank um, of East Asia, LTD, Bank of India, Bank of China, Metropolitan Bank, Trusting Company. All right, well, I guess that's good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, why don't we why don't we create so before we had this histogram where location was weighted by amount of money? Let's do what we did for that, but weight it by this new percentage that we just found. We should be able to repurpose that pretty quickly. Hopefully. Let's see. So what did we do? We took, where did I even get the assets? Oh, I don't even remember. Okay, I'll recreate it. <laughs> so let's get the entity value of this. We want to get the position and this new thing, this new function. Um, and we'll say that this is just our, our data kind of, then we're gonna weight that and apply it to the transpose. This is what we did earlier. I hope I'm not messing up here. And if we just do a geo smooth histogram of that, kind of going quick here, it didn't work. <laughs> so well, we it doesn't work, it shows your location. That's our company headquarters in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong, Zach? Well, maybe this percent form is actually messing it up. I'm going to get rid of that. Because we don't, we just want a raw number. We don't care about the, how it's displayed. Um, ooh, it's taking longer time. Ah, cool. Cool, cool, cool. So if I say this is weighted, then we're going to show this weighted data. And before we had done the geo range to United States, 
just copy that so I don't have to type it again. And this will show us a, hopefully, a density of banks with riskier holdings, I think. So there we have it. Now we see a lot more in New York, which we hadn't been seeing earlier. So for comparison, this is a density of more risky assets. This is a density of sort of total assets. Um, we didn't really see much out in New York. So that's pretty fascinating that New York City is really showing up here. And for comparison, this was just a histogram of total number of banks. So we had a lot of banks clustered around Illinois, but it turned out they didn't actually have a lot of money. Um, but they do have maybe riskier assets. Or I, I think that's what this is telling us. We're still unclear so. about this since we, we sort of rushed through getting this whole tier two, tier one. It's but... an interesting, it's an interesting plot nonetheless. <laughs> For sure. So if someone wants to look into that more and let us know what they find out, yeah, we'd be happy to, to learn more. I think there's a lot that can be learned from this data set. It's a pretty, it's a decently big data set. There's a lot bigger data sets. Um, 5,000 entities with 50 properties each isn't massive. As we saw it, it, it took, you know, maybe 10 seconds to do most of these calculations. So it's actually not too bad to work with. Um, so it's a fun data set. There hasn't been a ton done with it. So feel free to explore. Um, let us know what you come up with. You can always post, if you if you wanna write something out, post it on community, community.wolfram.com and let everyone see what your project was. That would be fascinating, I think. Um, I think we come up against our time here, but it was great to be back. Great to see everyone again. Uh, great to, to do some coding again, right, Zach? I had a lot of fun. Thank you for coming, everyone. I hope you learned something. I hope we all learned a little bit. Right? Yeah, thanks. I hope to see what you all can come up with. <laughs>